with is when you think of the atonement or or um the cross and resurrection what thoughts come to mind for you are you are you liking it are you thinking ooh I, I really don't like this business of crucifixion are you okay I, I get why God had to do this I mean what do you, what do you think well, I was raised in a Christian family. We went to church all, uh, every Sunday, and we did talk um, uh, about our, our faith. Um, and I think my first reaction to your question is, I didn't question anything. I mean, as a child, uh, we are given the story, and it... I can't even think it was shocking. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think it's rather shocking, you know, crucifixion. What, what, what's that all about? Except, uh, again, um, uh, Norma and I have been going through the Apocrypha with the Bible study group. And um, you talk about the violence. Yeah. And uh, how the the Jewish people um, it was just constant in, in biblically in the Old Testament as well and so I think in terms of the crucifixion being the most we lost your sound there Joanne oh no we lost it yeah we can't hear you, Joanne. Joanne, your sound is gone. Did you? It, it almost had to be the most evil way of, of punishing a person. If you're going to think about Jesus taking on the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I'm known to make things up. <laughs> So when I finish something like that, I'm just going, well, I was, I, no, I didn't make it up. But, you know, <laughs> we're trying to make sense of it. Isn't that the title of this whole yeah, thing? You're just trying yeah. to make sense of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, for me, mine was just like Joanne, you know, with um, just accepting everything and then, you know, just changes as you are older and you think of that horror. And I think um, of the cross, um, you know, you see a lot of people wearing the cross and it's just a symbol of the cross. And our 15 year old grandson wears one, you know, all the time. And, um, but there is something just in the cross away from um, the horror of it. Uh, and you like, we talked one time here, Joanne, with um, the, the palm crosses. Mm -hmm. um, that really gives me comfort for some reason. And it's just, you know, I, I don't know why, but there, it's just a little bit of strength. Mm -hmm. I love looking at the cross at Trinity. Mm -hmm. And I think about the sacrifice. But a lot of it is, you know, things that you just, I just have to take in trust because it's so so unbelievable to do such a horrible thing mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, you know just understanding god you know allowing that to happen or jesus you know mm -hmm. accepting that and uh, well i don't know the cross is um, it's a symbol but it has a lot of uh, you know, the, the, the idea of just uh, along with the cross uh, reminds me uh, the church I grew up in had a crucifixion in the uh, crucifix in the front. Um, and with Jesus, usually, the, pardon? With Jesus on the cross? Or empty? Yeah, it was a crucifix. And um, uh, I. I didn't think anything about that either, you know, but, but 
when um, listen to me, um, when Norma was talking about the the hand crosses and whatnot and how that feels good in your hand, that's empty of the corpus. Mm -hmm. It's smooth. Uh, it doesn't have any slivers in it. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have a cross with the risen Christ on it, correct? So some people would prefer that image of the cross. Mm -hmm. So we're looking beyond the crucifixion to the Easter people right. uh, idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The empty cross to, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I'll admit, I, I have a real problem with the cross as the symbol for the Christian church. I, um, and I guess part of it, part of it's the discomfort of the violence involved. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a hard time believing that this was really a plan that God felt needed to happen this way. It, it just creates some real dissonance for me. But also for me, um, when I hear people of other religions talk about how... Um, how disturbed they are. How disturbed they are. Okay. By, um, by, um, by, by the whole idea of that's what we use as a symbol for our, um, for our faith is, is the cross and the violence there, which made me kind of also think differently about, well, what are we trying to say? by having that as, as a, a symbol. Um, and if I don't have a storyline that I feel is good to go with it, why am I using it? So needless to say, I have issues. <laughs> and the, I th just to add a little bit to that too, I think, I, th I think the, one of the kind of simple explanations of of what Jesus does on the cross is that Jesus died for our sins, right? And I think oftentimes that's a, you know, that's an oversimplification of, of what's going on. It just, it leaves a lot out to dissect what God is up to in the, mid, in the middle of that. Uh, so I, I struggle with that too. I struggle with the, uh, um, you know, I think there's there's more that the that the story gets into in terms of power and agency and who's you know who's doing what and what's the allowing or letting happen and what's the kind of um, the circumstantial nature of it versus the versus the kind of planned nature of what's going on. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, welcome, John. I think um, based on what time it is, I'm going to play, have Peter play the first video. Um, and it's entitled A Man Hanging on a Tree. That'll kind of prompt some more discussion. And then after that, we'll get into the first um, theology of atonement. Hi, my name is David Lofs, and I'm the author of Making Sense of the Cross, and also have the chance to be your guide through the video sessions that accompany the course materials that allow you to explore this book in a group study session. We're going to spend a lot of time together talking about the meaning of the cross. Now, I know on the one hand, that might seem like a little bit of an unusual question. Why is the cross so important? Because we see the cross everywhere. Think about it. It's on the top of our building. Sometimes it's on the front walls. Our hymnals, Bibles have crosses on them. You see crosses, people wearing crosses all the time. It's so clearly at the center of our faith. So why ask questions about it? Well, what I found often in teaching and in conversation with people is that sometimes those things that are right in front of us, those things that are right up front, are the oh. ones we don't often know the most about. In fact, sometimes we get a little embarrassed to ask questions because we feel like this is something we ought to know already. If you're not sure about the way you understand the cross, 
or where the cross fits into the larger Christian faith, I want you to know up front, that's fine. All of us have questions. Some of them are kind of small. Why does John tell the story of Jesus' cross one way and Mark tell a little bit differently? Some are much larger. Why all this violence? How is God redeeming the world through the suffering of this one person? And what does this tell us about how God might also be up to redemption in and through our own suffering? Whatever your questions, bring them. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm looking forward very much to jumping into this material with you. One of the things that might help us in asking our questions is to recognize that faithful Christians have been asking questions about the cross for the last two millennia. Really, every major theologian of the Christian church has had the cross at the center of his or her theological work. But you know, it goes back even further, even deeper, because Jesus' original followers, that is, the disciples themselves, didn't know what to make of the cross. Nobody saw the cross coming. Think about it. Believers in biblical times, as well, truth be told, as those who live today, when we typically think about God, we think about God in terms of power. And so people expected God to come in power, like a warrior or a king, to rescue God's people. But what did they get? They got this mild-mannered Jewish rabbi who came teaching and preaching the kingdom of God, who had compassion on those who were around him, who healed here and fed there, who did miracles, who proclaimed forgiveness left and right, and who ended up offending the religious and political authorities of his day so that he was crucified. That is, this teacher that held so much promise ended up on a cross dying as a common criminal. Actually, more than a common criminal. The cross, crucifixion, was something that the Roman Empire reserved for those they wanted to make a public example of. In fact, if you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. It was reserved for those who seemed the worst of the worst and needed to be executed in a public way. So when Jesus came proclaiming the coming kingdom of God and gathered all these followers who were so hopeful that in him God was doing a new and mighty and powerful thing, and then when he was taken from them and crucified like a criminal, it turned their world upside down. They had to rethink just about everything they had assumed, particularly about two things. First, what was their picture of God now? If God wasn't a mighty warrior king, but instead was working in and through the life, death, and resurrection of this teacher, what did God look like? Second, they started also rethinking the way they understood their tradition. That is, they went back to their scriptures, what we often call the Old Testament, and read again the Psalms and the prophecies and the stories of God's mighty deeds in the past in a new way through the lens of the cross. So asking questions about the cross is central to Christian faith. And it's not only Christian theologians who are asking these questions. All kinds of people from different faiths and from different walks of life have questions about God, who God is, what God is, how God is for us, where and how God is present with us in suffering. So maybe you saw a movie not too long ago that seemed to echo a story in the Bible that you'd heard about the cross, or maybe read a book where one of the characters went through some suffering and found that redemptive. We're going to look to these writers and authors, directors, actors, and sometimes borrow from their insights as well to help us make sense of the biblical story of what God is up to in and through Christ's cross and resurrection. Part of the reason our questions about the cross matter so much is that whatever we say about the cross, we're also saying about God. I want to go back to something I mentioned just a moment or so ago when I said most of us tend to think about God in terms of God's power. This also has been true for most of Christian theology. There's been a tendency to define God in terms of God's attributes. You probably know what I mean. We might use words like omniscient, that means God is all-knowing, or omnipotent, God is all-powerful, or we might talk about God being all-just or all-holy. All these are ways to try and give language to something that is bigger and larger than us. And so it's understandable that we might think about God and revert almost immediately to talking about God's attributes. The challenge is that before long, we've described a God that is so big, so huge, so holy, so just, that it's really hard for us to imagine this God being involved with us, this God being approachable to us, this God caring about us, this God being able to put up with us. 
Before long, the God of attributes can be so big that that God is terrifying, even crushing. Martin Luther, a 16th century monk and reformer of the church, had a very similar experience. He grew up in the medieval world that stressed God's attributes, that God was all just, all holy, all knowing, and it terrified him. Later in his life, Luther would look back, in fact, and say that that God, the God of attributes, not only terrified him, but drove him to hate God. Luther instead insisted on looking not at God's attributes, that is what we think about God, but instead Luther wanted us to look to what God actually did in the person of Jesus. And what Luther saw there was one who came and taught and preached and healed and forgave and was crucified. Luther was convinced finally that all of our conversations about God needed to start with the cross. You can still all talk about attributes, but you need to see those attributes, even redefine those attributes, in light of what you find at that man hanging on a tree. So what does all-knowing look like when Jesus is afraid or uncertain about the future? What does all-powerful look like when you see Jesus, who we confess is God, hanging on the cross? This is what sometimes we've called Luther's theology of the cross, and this is part of what we're going to do, too. We're going to be open to risking our opinions about God, to put our views of God on the table, and to ask again and again, what does that look like? What does that sound like in light of what God actually did in and through Christ's cross and resurrection? So here's our plan for getting at all of these questions. We're going to spend a fair amount of time together looking at what Christians have said across the centuries about the cross. In fact, we're going to group a lot of the best insights Christians have had into three schools of thought or three camps or three broad approaches to understanding God's work in the cross. These are sometimes called theories of atonement, and I just want to spend just a minute with this term, this word atonement. It's a theological word, but it's also an everyday word. It's actually a theological word that comes out of the English language, maybe one of the only ones. Most theology comes from Latin or Greek, Hebrew, German, French. But this word, at its root, means exactly what it says, atonement, that is, at one meant. To atone for something is to recognize that something valuable to you, something important to you, is broken. And what you want to do is somehow make up for that repair it, make it better, take what was broken into many pieces and make them at one again. And so each of these theories or each of these three schools of thought about the cross tries to understand what is going on, how God is at work to atone, to make that which was broken one once again. Before going there, though, we're first going to review the stories of the cross and resurrection in the Bible. That is, we're going to look at each of the four gospel accounts and to try to hear the distinct confession of each author about what God is up to in and through the cross of Christ. With that in mind, we'll look at these three theories of the atonement, and then we'll come back at the end and weigh these in the balance of our own experiences, our own faith, and ask together the question of how can Christ's cross and resurrection not only be important in general, but also important to us? That is, how can what God did so long ago in and through Christ's cross and resurrection shape our lives today? So, um, so he brings up a, a interesting point about how we oftentimes think of God by attributes. And um, is there is there something in in the attributes that you may have thought of about God that maybe has been a challenge as a result of also looking at the cross? And by the way, welcome, John. We've got two Johns. I love it. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm late because of church, of course, driving. That's quite all right. <laughs> um, so for me, one of the things that, um, you know, the uh, the all-knowing part, the omniscient, you know, um, 
is, is like, well, what would that mean if you're all knowing and you're being crucified and I keep thinking and you're all powerful, then couldn't you have figured out a different system? <laughs> and so that wraps around in my head and I'm like, well, I get, I'm not God. So, you know, lack of understanding is reasonable, but that's something that when I look at it with the cross, I still have a hard time. Like, well, what does it mean? You know, um, or did we get it wrong? Did that, you know, is that attribute that we've come up with skewed? So that's something for me, just as an example. Go ahead, John. Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to say, go ahead, John. John, <laughs> saying, go ahead. Yes, John. One of the things that I think about is those rectifying the loving God that we have and then also the judgmental God. You know, in other words, I love to think about God being loving and forgiving, but then we have the whole issue of the judgmental part and, you know, the issue of heaven and hell and, and everything. And, and how can, um, you know, to a degree, it may be being parenting, you know, you're, you're going to be loving to your ch children as they're growing up and trying to help them through things, but you're going to possibly punish them if they've misbehaved. I remember getting spanked as a young kid more than once. And, uh, but the, um, th that's sort of a, a paradox that to me has somewhat always been a little troubling. Thank you for sharing that. Other John. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you mentioned Petty that you weren't, if he was all powerful, um, why did he let himself die? And I think it says something about uh, Christ the human that saying things and doing and not doing them um, is, a, is really a statement. So what if what if uh, what if Christ would have said, "Okay, I'm not going to go through any more pain anymore. I'm not going to die for your sins. I was I don't want to do that. That's too painful." Uh, he didn't do that, and so I I I constantly go back to what what was so unique about Christ, the Son of God. He's connected in a funny way between the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and we're not really sure how that works, but but we know that Christ lived on earth, and when he said something, he did it, and if he said something and he didn't do it, I don't think we would, we would really care too much about Christ. Uh, Christ, uh, which, which kind, of, kind of comes back full circle to 2021 when we have many, many Christians talk up a storm like like I, I i believe in love i believe in helping your fellow man but what they do is is not very loving and it's not helping their fellow man and i think that's i think uh, a christian who believes that uh my personal opinion a christian who believes that uh christ died for our sins and uh but at the same time, doesn't believe in anything that Christ did, any of his behaviors, loving, non-judgmental, helping people, all sorts of things that Christ did. I don't actually think he's a Christian, and it's it, to me, it's a it's 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 a hypocrisy that uh, has kind of come come to roost. That we have maybe the maybe amongst the worst hypocrites in the world are Christians. And how do you, how does that work? Well, I don't actually consider the worst, worst hypocrites in the world Christians because if somebody doesn't believe in what Christ did, doesn't believe in love, I don't believe he's a Christian. That's my personal opinion. And okay. I, I struggle with that. Thank you for sharing. Um, Joanne, I muted you because you were feedbacking, but go ahead and unmute. <laughs> I'm free. Okay, it's happened. I predicted that was going to happen. Um, I'm just, I'm just have a thought here. I want to throw out or maybe throw away. Um, 
are we talking about God's had a plan for redemption uh, through a crucifixion? Or are we looking at God created, starting in Genesis, something beautiful, and he had an idea. I don't know that he had a plan. He had an idea. And we screwed it up immediately, if not sooner. And we the, the whole story, biblically and historically, is we keep messing with that beautiful idea. And it's not God that planned the crucifixion. We did that because we, again, screwed it up. And it then God came into the picture and um, made good out of an evil. I don't know how that works. Joanne, you are so many Sundays ahead of me. <laughs> I, I need feedback, Pastor Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for I really, sharing. Uh, I really like that, Joanne, and just the idea that, uh, you know, kind of, a, again, t taking some time to parse out, you know, who, what what role God has in this, what role people or humans have in this. And, you know, regardless of whether people screw up, that God just continues to find ways to try to make it right again. Um, and that's, you know, that I think that's uh, that's a real challenge to the idea of omniscience, too. That's mm -hmm. a real challenge to the idea of um, omnipotence and in, in that God, God is actually giving up power and control in order to be in relationship uh with us and and willing to you know willing to amend those amend those plans in order to best serve our relationship uh, and what that what that dream that god has is um but i i think that's what i think often for me it's the actual it's the biblical story itself that challenges those all you know all powerful all holy all just you know, all just until there's mercy, you know, and then, um, it's all just until there's forgiveness. It's all just or all holy until there's grace. Um, and those are, those are all, you know, those are challenges to those kind of simple ways of looking at God. Thanks. Um, I'm going to, because of the length of the next clip, we're going to go to that. I'm sure we could do a lot more talking about things but the first theory or theology of atonement is um justice oh no wait that? ransom and victory so pastor peter's going to play that for us and then we'll have some time to discuss it Hi, my name is David Lowe. Welcome back to Making Sense of the Cross. In the last chapter, you'll remember, or the last session we had together, we talked about the Bible, the Gospels, and these four different stories that the Gospel writers tell us about Jesus, and particularly about his cross and resurrection. This week, we're going to begin our exploration of three theories of what we called atonement. That is, how does God take what is broken and make it at one, heal it or repair it again? Now, one of the things you might remember we said about the Gospels is that each of them was written to a particular community in particular circumstances with particular questions, right? So Mark's writing to a community that might have come through a recent period of struggle or suffering or persecution, whereas Luke is writing to a community that's struggling with, what do we do with all these Jews and Gentiles and people of multiple faiths? The same is going to be important to keep in mind with these three different theories of atonement, that is, these three schools of thought of how we can understand the cross. We're going to want to think about where did they come from and what were the issues and the challenges and the questions that Christians were asking at the time and how might we understand these theories as answers to those questions. That's going to be important because it will help us then 
weigh and assess and evaluate how valuable, how useful, how helpful those theories are to us in our own time and circumstances. All right, so the first theory we want to talk about was formulated in the early centuries of the Christian faith, that is, in the years immediately after, the couple centuries immediately after the events the Gospels tell. Uh, and it was pretty influential for almost a thousand years. Now, the two things I want you to keep in mind as we're talking about this theory is first, that although we tend today to think about the cross often in terms of forgiveness, that wasn't the major issue or question of believers in the ancient world. They had a different set of questions that revolved around the nature of life and of death, and maybe not surprisingly, of life after death. They wanted to know what happened. They wanted to know how God dealt with this major specter and problem of death. Second thing to keep in mind is that this theory is originally formulated when the church, the Christian witness, is a minority group. It's one of a number of traditions. Uh, in fact, it's often looked down upon by a number of other traditions, including, at this point in history, the Roman Empire. And so the Christians of this day are experiencing struggle, challenge, persecution, martyrdom, and this theory arises out of their reflections of how it is that God is saving, working through all of this struggle and this conflict for the redemption, not just of them, but of the whole world. Of the three theories we're going to talk about, three understandings of atonement, this first one, the ancient theory of atonement, in some ways will be the most difficult or unusual for us to I think grapple with, in part because the mindset, the questions of these ancient believers are in many ways very different from our own. Um, in the ancient world, there was a real clear and palpable sense, not only of God, but also of the devil and of the struggle of these two cosmic powers, one for good and one for evil, and a strong belief that perpetuated, that permeated through the Christian environment that the Christian life was caught up in the struggle. And so when they make sense of the cross, they make sense of it in these same cosmic terms. So I'll try to explain it, and if you have questions, great, that's what it's about. Ask them, talk about them, share them. Together we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll get through this and see how it applies to our own life. All right, so the basic issue at stake for these early Christians is to think about how it is that humanity can ever be rescued from the clutches of the devil. The theory goes that when humans sin in Adam and Eve, and every time since, that we become the possession, we become the property of Satan, that Satan has a claim on us. There's kind of a scheme that understands that, that everything in the world has a part to play. And in some ways, the role that Satan is expected to play is that of the jailer or uh, the keeper or the one who punishes sinful humans. Now, the problem is that although God has set up this system and wants to live within the rules, God loves humanity and doesn't want to give humanity over to Satan forever. And so what God does is then come into the story in a more direct or more personal way by becoming human in the person of Jesus. Now, at this point, there are two variations on this ancient theory. One of them imagines that what happens when God comes in the person of Jesus in the flesh is that Satan sees Jesus and assumes that because he's human, that Satan can lay claim to him the way he has everyone else, uh, uh, the way Satan has laid claim on every other human because of original sin. And so when Jesus dies, Satan claims him and brings him down to hell, and yet then is surprised, is, is even tricked in that Jesus isn't a human like every other human. Jesus is fully human, but also fully God. And so, in fact, Satan has no claim on him and has overextended his reach, has broken the rules, has grabbed off too much, bitten off more than he can chew. Ancient Christians actually sometimes would say that Jesus' flesh was like the worm on a fishing line and that Satan comes along as this big fish, grabs hold of the worm, but gets stuck on the hook of Jesus' divinity. All right, the other way that early Christians, the other variation that Christians played with this, this theme is that um, God recognized that the only way he could redeem humanity was to give something else of equal or greater value to Satan. That is, Satan has a claim, has a right to own humanity. God wants humanity back, and so 
God must give Satan, pay Satan something, some kind of ransom to bring back humanity. And that ransom is Jesus. And Satan, knowing that Jesus is not just a human, but is the very Son of God, assumes that if he takes hold of Jesus, then not only will we have the Son of God, but in time he'll be able to bring all humanity back as well. But again, Satan is surprised. He didn't count on the fact that Jesus was more powerful than death, that Jesus, because he was sinless and perfect, could not be kept by Satan. And so when Jesus is raised from the dead, death cannot hold him, so also all of lost humanity is raised with him. Now again, I mentioned this is the theory that's, a, that's the hardest in some ways for us to get a handle on because it's the most cosmic, it's the most, most mythic in nature. But two uh, stories that we might be, fam- might be familiar with might help us. The first, actually, this version of Satan biting off more than he can chew, not realizing that, uh, that, that moving toward his goal is going to be his downfall. Think for a minute of the movie Star Wars that so many of us have seen probably more times <laughs> than we want to admit. Think particularly of that scene on the Death Star where Darth Vader approaches Obi-Wan Kenobi. And there's this moment where they're battling and they're evenly mashed and all the rest that you might remember with lightsabers and all. And then Ben Kenobi says to Darth Vader, you cannot conquer. Even if you strike me down, I will come back more powerful than ever. And then what does he do? He holds his sword up and makes himself a sacrifice and Vader cuts him down. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. He doesn't win. That Kenobi is released back to the force and guides Luke Skywalker and, and you know the rest of the story. All right, there's something very similar to one of the versions of the cross being expressed here in the Star Wars movie. Other place to think about for a minute is um, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Remember that story too? You have four children of Adam, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve who come, and Edmund is the one who goes off with the white witch, the, the, the devil character in the story, and he sins. He uh, falls under the witch's clutches. And so she then naturally has a claim on him even when he realizes he's made a huge mistake. At that point into the story comes Aslan, the great lion, who for Lewis is a symbol of of Jesus Christ. And Aslan wants to redeem Edmund, but recognizes the witch has this claim on him. So remember what he does? He actually offers a trade, offers himself in Edmund's place. And the witch seizes on it eagerly, greedily, because she thinks if she can get Aslan, uh, the son of the emperor across the sea, then her victory is assured. Mm -hmm. But what happens? She puts him to death on the stone table, and yet death cannot hold him. So Aslan, when he's explaining this to the children, will remind them that, that although the witch knew the deep magic, that is the rules of who lays claim to what, she'd forgotten or maybe never knew the deeper magic, that one who is wholly innocent, when he gives his life for another, cannot be held by death. All right, as I mentioned, I know this is a fairly complex, in some ways, cosmic story we're trying to get our heads around. Um, But we're going to follow a pattern with each of the three theories of atonement that I think will help. After trying to give a basic outline of the picture or story of this theory of atonement, then we're going to ask four questions. And after those four questions, then we'll look at the pros and cons of each. So when it comes to this classic ancient theory of atonement, I want to ask four things. First, what's the problem? That is, how does this understanding of the cross portray our human dilemma, our plight? What is it that we need being rescued from? Well, in terms of the ancient theory we just talked about, it is that because we have sinned, right, from Adam and Eve on, we're all captive to sin, which means we are captive to Satan. The devil has a rightful, lawful, even natural claim on us, which means our futures are pretty dim. All right, second question. What's the resolution? What's the response? How does the cross make atonement happen? As we said, there are kind of two versions here. In each of them, God takes on human flesh. Jesus, the Son of God, walks among us and as one of us. And in one of these theories, Satan overreaches. Satan sees Jesus and grabs hold of him and brings him down to death, but can't hold on to the true Son of God. In the other, God actually offers Jesus as a ransom, offers to trade Jesus for lost humanity, and Satan eagerly agrees, but, when, uh, but forgets that Satan can't hold on to this innocent Son of God. And so when Jesus is raised, we're all raised with him. 
All right, so what's the problem? What's the resolution? The third question I want to ask is, what is God like? That is, how does this theory help us imagine what God is, who God is for us? Well, according to this theory, God loves humanity enough to get into the mix, to get into the fray, to struggle, to wrestle, and eventually to be victorious. Now, that's the positive. The, the thing we're going to want to explore a little bit is that God is willing enough to get into fray, to, to, to treat Satan in some ways almost like an equal player. And so God resorts to paying Satan or tricking Satan. And again, that's something we're, we're going to want to explore a little further. All right, fourth question. What's the problem? What's the resolution? What does God look like? What does the Christian life look like? That is, how does this theory help us imagine the nature and the shape of our daily life in the world as Christians. And here, this theory struggles a little bit. It doesn't actually say that much about the details of our daily lives. There's a way in which the story is told on such a grand or cosmic scheme that it never totally touches ground and helps us think about how to be Christian, except in one important way, actually. Again, remember what I said, the Christians who are first formulating this theory are living at a time where Christians are often persecuted. And so imagining that the Christian life is like a struggle, that God gets involved in the struggle, that our life is caught up in this titanic struggle between good and evil, was very helpful to them, and also, quite frankly, has been helpful to modern communities, whether it's Latin American or African or Chinese Christian communities that themselves may be, where they themselves may be experiencing struggle or persecution. And so at some times, we may also find that it helps to think about our life as a struggle and take comfort that God is with us, and more than that, that God will bring us through in the end victoriously. All right, having offered a picture of the theory and asked our four questions of it, I want to think now for a moment about the pros and the cons. That is, what are the strengths of this ancient theory of atonement, and maybe what are its limitations? Well, the strengths are, in fact, that it offers this really vivid, powerful story of God getting mixed up in the struggle. It takes both cross and resurrection very seriously and sees these elements of, of Jesus' story as the moments of God's triumph. As I mentioned, communities throughout the church's history that have suffered persecution have found great comfort in this idea that God struggles, God's willing to get into the game, and eventually to bring them out victoriously. Um, I think one of the other things that's really valuable about this theory is that it takes resurrection so seriously. It's very easy for Christians, and we'll see this as we look at more theories. It's very easy for Christians to get so caught up in the cross that the resurrection is almost an afterthought. But here, that really matters. That is, it's, it's enough to see in Jesus God willing to suffer, struggle, and die. But finally, the critical moment is, in fact, resurrection, that death cannot hold life, that sin cannot contain or defeat grace, that God is more powerful than all that stands against us. All right, having looked at that, I want to also, though, think about some of the limitations or weaknesses to this theory also. And there are a couple, and maybe the first is the easy one. Um, on the one hand, it's, it's, as we said, it's a great story. It's a cosmic story, and maybe that's why we see it popping up in places uh, like Star Wars or C.S. Lewis or others have connected it to the Matrix and, and beyond um, because of these this cosmic uh, universal elements. But for some of us, that will also be a little bit of the weakness. That is, it's hard for us to relate to it. It's hard for us to imagine that it isn't just a C.S. Lewis story or a fantasy movie. It's hard for us to understand how it uh, connects to our daily lives. Second weakness is that it emphasizes a few portions of the biblical witness. Um, it, there's a verse in Mark that talks where Jesus says, not only has the Son of Man come not to be served, but to serve, but also to give his life as a ransom for many. And that term ransom becomes very important, as we've seen in this theory. It's hard to know, or actually it's, it's unlikely that Mark imagined ransom in quite the same ways. Um, but that becomes a signature verse. This, this uh, theory of atonement also plays strongly to John's gospel, the heroic Jesus that we looked at, and particularly John's, the last thing John reports Jesus as saying on the cross. It is finished, we usually translate it, but better, it is accomplished. That is, the cross is the moment of triumph, not defeat. 
uh, and there are elements of Paul and Revelation. But it leaves out, this theory leaves out scads of other reflections on the cross uh, about forgiveness, about compassion, about healing, and those are elements we'll want to see picked up in other theories. Last weakness, maybe, for some of us that we want to pay attention to is that we can get a little unsettled by the picture of God this theory portrays. Um, that is, on the one hand, it's great to think about God getting in the mix, joining the fight, struggling with Satan to win us back. On the other hand, there's something a little, I don't know, fishy or odd or even unseemly about God needing to trick the devil uh, or God being willing to pay the devil. And there's a kind of peculiar element there that haunts this theory, that dogs it. In fact, it's the place we'll want to start, or at least the next theory we'll look at we'll want to start, and we'll go there in the next session. So just a little bit of stuff to chew on there. <laughs> um, so how about we just kind of take a look at, so what things of this brought some comfort to you or were uncomfortable in, in this way of looking at atonement? Does this sound at all familiar to you? Joanne. I, um, I, I have trouble with the devil. I, I don't understand that, uh, that, well, I know it's, it's, it's a concept and that probably was used um, to create an understanding of evil and whether we've got the, the red horned uh, Satan um, that we have images of. So I'm, I'm thinking even when Jesus talked, uh, said, you know, get thee behind me, Satan. I, I um, understand that for him to use the word Satan, because that's what the people understood. But Satan just means evil, in, in my estimation. Uh, get behind me, evil. Uh, untruths, you know. So I have trouble with Satan. And then what was just said at towards the end with that idea of the ransom and that this is, it is finished. Um, I kind of go the, uh, the same kind of idea there. Now, those books were written X number of years after um, Jesus ascended. Um, so they were talking theology then, and they were having their agreements and disagreements about what just happened. And so they, they aren't sure what happened either. Was it a ransom or was it finishing? You know, those, are, those are my two questions. No answers, just wonderments. Thank you, Joanne. So one thing to, to kind of point out to you too is, you know, and, and we're, we're skipping the, the one video that he kind of compares the different gospel stories, but it's in the book. If you get the book or we'll have, you know, if you decide not to get the book, we'll have at least one copy or more available to check out from the library too, um, at Trinity. But, um, there are four gospel stories and they each kind of emphasize different things. And some people would argue that, well, that just makes it worse because there's, there's lack of agreement on every point. And others would say, well, but that makes it a, a richer way of looking at it to understand maybe what was going on. Because like you said, Joanne, they were, you know, they were writing theology at the same time of stating, you know, you know, we did this and then we went here and then we went there. It, it was more than just a, a, a travelogue of what happened. So there could be benefits from that as well. So that was a, a great thing to point out. Anyone else? Yes, John, John S. Um, you're muted, John, you can unmute.
I like when he talked about the fact that instead of being it is finished, it is accomplished. You know, I think that um, it sort of focuses on the fact that the forgiveness that we have and it's the story of the prodigal son keeps coming to mind how all of us regardless of what we've done can be forgiven if we have faith and if we trust and if we believe in salvation through jesus so i, th I thought that the way he interpreted that uh instead of it is finished it is accomplished i thought was meaningful thank you i'll just add i really like the the idea in this theory that god is a trickster that that uh you know using jesus as bait somehow is i i actually kind of like that um i i too struggle like you do joanne with the the personification of evil as in satan um but it gives i i like the i like the story element of it i think the the way that it can be this kind of cosmic force of good and evil uh the powers and principalities versus god and god kind of finding a way to um both entice and entrap and overwhelm the forces of evil it's kind of the love wins uh, love wins ultimately that uh, that can kind of come through that but I don't yeah yeah I don't uh, I don't like the the and this gets into the other ones too but I don't like the you know it's this the 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 idea of ransom um, as being this kind of equal to or or how to kind of equal the scales piece but I do like God as trickster, which there are lots of kind of spiritual dimensions and um, and kind of expressions of of God as trickster too. Yeah, there's a different perspective when you when you mention it like that between being a trickster versus paying ransom. Yeah, yeah, it's different. It's different. definitely different perspective, which I hadn't really picked up on. So, mm -hmm. thanks. That's that's good. Anyone else have thoughts on this one? John B. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I have uh, in my bedroom here, you can't see it, but I have a, a cross over here and I have a laughing Jesus over there. <laughs> and people and people have more than one. You know, there's a serious side of me and I'm sure there's a serious side of everybody. And there's a, I, whether you want to call him a trickster or... Um, a human side of Christ, because there is a human side of Christ. But I too struggle with the concept of the devil, because the devil take kind of takes off, uh, takes off the responsibility. And I remember of an old, uh, of an old uh, Flip Wilson used to say, "The devil made me do it." When he would, some of his humor, "The devil made me do it." And I just wonder if that isn't a certain amount of people saying, "Hey." We're not. We're really not responsible for everything we do because we're we're being forced to do these things by by the by the devil. And you know, I think I think uh, uh, the fourth question he asked. What I think it says, says something about what about humanity? What about Christians? What the, the Christian life looks like? Yeah. What is a Christian life? So what if the Christian life uh, believed in believed in a life uh, that Christ died for our sins? and believe that Christ was the son of God and believe that it was all right to hate and believe that it was all right to, uh, to cheat and to kill and to be any, anything you want to for yourself. That wouldn't be a very, uh, I don't think that, that, that would attract many people, even though some people might, might like it a lot because it takes them off the hook. But uh, I, I think that's the thing I'd like to know is what, is, what does it mean to be a Christian? And I, I, I worry about that now because I think uh, uh, Christians are not attending church like they should. And there's, it's not because they're bad people either. Uh, Christ, Christianity has taken a, taken a hit, I think, to some degree, my opinion here, 
uh, with the with the Christian right not being very Christian, you know, not about love, certainly not about not judging, uh, certainly not about loving your neighbor, and uh, the the value of Christianity is defined by the value of what about Christians? How are they? Are they good people? In which case Christianity is pretty pretty good, or are they kind of not so good people, in which case, who cares about Christianity? Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. Then you throw in the devil, you can basically say, hey, it's none of our fault, it's the devil. No, I don't, I don't think so. Thank you, John. Norma, did you have anything you wanted to share? I don't want to pressure you, but if, if you do, I want to give you an opportunity, and you are on mute if you so choose to share. Oh, you're still muted. Um, all of what you said was meaningful to me. And I think if from that first um, video, even the comment that he said, um, we've described such a big God with all of the attributes that um, it's hard to see him with us and that Jesus um, is here. <laughs> And, you know, John's comments about love and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It just, that feels good to me. I'm just going to get something quickly to show you. Okay. I might have mentioned this before, but this is, um, sits on my kitchen counter. And um, so I look at it every time I open the microwave, <laughs> but um, it's a cross, a heart, and a stone. And those three things, and you're talking so strongly about love, um, are always part of my life. The stone is actually from the Valley of Elah in, um, in Israel, um, with Goliath, but it reminds me of the resurrection. The stone is rolled away and the cross. So those... Um, they tied so well to what we discussed today, and I'm grateful for that. So oh, thanks for sharing that. That was that was beautiful. Yep. Yep. Yeah, if, when I first heard this 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 video, I was like, "Well, I don't find anything good about this one at all." <laughs> and then I went back and I I listened to it again and and read, and I was like, "Okay, so." One of the things that's comforting to me about this is for whatever reason, we got this weird rule system about how there's some sort of need to trick the devil or pay him back or whatever, um, which I just don't get. But the, the comforting thing is, is God loves humanity enough to figure out a way around it to get us back. And so for me, that's the comforting piece of this, that there's that connection there of, okay, so we'll, you know, plan B, plan C, plan D, I'll, I'll get something to work. So for me, that's the comforting component of this. Um, the part that doesn't really resonate with so much of what I recall being taught and told is the whole idea of redemption, forgiveness, you know, that whole bit, that limitation of um, compassion. There's really not a, a thing about how to live the Christian life. There's really not a, any kind of a bringing in of what Jesus did with his life in this. So that to me is a shortcoming that I, I can't quite sort out but definitely that positive component of um well guess we'll go to plan b i'll get something to work because i love humanity enough i i want to i want to still have humanity in relationship with me so that's the that's a positive for me on this one i think there's an application of that with the christian life the you know plan b plan c you know, there's an adaptability to life that I think really does mirror that uh, finding a way forward, finding a way through um, that I do, you know, that I think I like that reflection onto the Christian life from this theory. Uh, but I totally get what you're saying. 
Well, that's a nice perspective, though, the adaptability. You know, that there's kind of like, just as God is willing to do X for us in this, you know, in this circumstance, like, I think there's an invitation there to what are we willing to uh, to go through or to how do you know to problem solve to fix to redeem to heal to um, to find a way forward to together uh, as a community as the body of Christ. Thank you. Uh, I would kind of comment on uh, I know it's a little after twelve and I'll make this short. Yeah. But I'm a I'm a father three times over and I just got a I'm a I'm a grandfather five times over and a lot of people have more or less kids but. One of the things you do know when, you, when you're a father, and I know that, that the same thing is true with mothers and what have you, is that if, you're, if one of your kids asks you for help, you're never going to say, you know what, I'm not going to help you. That's just the way it is. Bye. Uh, let's talk. That just, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you feel like you don't know what to say. Okay. And, then, and, and God doesn't do that. And so I like the concept of the, in some respects, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, because I know what a father is, uh, is that if you ever have a question, you can talk to him, and he will, he will uh, put his mind on you, and of course, I don't mean to say my mind is anything like God's mind, but the concept that you never say no to your children, and, and you come back with a plan A, and a B, and a C, and a D, and it goes on forever. My, I had to laugh, because my daughter uh, she's just you know six weeks into the birth of her child and i said don't worry tracy this will be over with in about 25 years <laughs> the truth truth be told it never is over with you i mean if you're lucky i'm i'm a very lucky person uh your kids are always part of your life which means they share the problems they have too and that that is how i see god he just uh he's just a little smarter than a lot smarter than me and he's always there when you got a problem. He never says, "Ah, don't have time for you. Let's get, let's go on to, let's do something." But I don't, I'm not going to help you with that problem. That's not what a, that's not what a father does or a mother does, for that matter. Thank you, John. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we there's a lot more that we could discuss on this. Um, definitely next week we'll only be talking about one theology of atonement so we'll have a little bit more time to discuss around that and pastor chris is going to lead that one um next week and it's substitution satisfaction and sacrifice is the title of that one and i think i i did list those also in the trinity today so you can kind of see what's coming up so if you haven't gotten a book and would like to get one you can pick them up at the church they're ten dollars you most certainly don't need to have it um, but people might find that they, they like the way it's written. It's in a discussion format. And, um, but like I said, you can most certainly, um, get a lot out of the videos and conversations without having the books. So I don't want you to feel you have to get one. Um, I thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And, um, I always learn so much from you guys. So, um, I just really appreciate you showing up today and, and coming with this. And I um, hope you have a really good week. So, thank you. Thanks, Benny. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep.